Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. Last week we looked at chapter 1 and it started off with him basically a, a, he comes to the Lord and he, he makes a prayer and he, he says to him, Lord, things are messed up here. We got a lot of problems going on. We got a lot of evil going on. Are you going to continue allowing this to continue? Or are you, are you going to do something about it? And as he went along, eventually the Lord comes and he provides an answer to him and tells him that uh, the Babylonians are, or he calls them the Chaldeans, but it's the Babylonians so he's referring to. He says that they're going to come and they're going to conquer Judah. They're going to take them into captivity. They're going to overthrow them because of the sin that's going on. And Habakkuk, when he is given this vision, when he's told this by the Lord, he's a little bit confused. Because he looks at the Babylonians and he goes, Lord, they're an evil people too. In some counts, they're worse than, Israel, than Judah is. So why in the world are you, why are you using them to overthrow your people to punish them? Like, this doesn't make sense, Lord. Why are you providing power to a nation that is deceitful? That's just as bad, if not worse. And he points out a few things, and he says, and if you allow them to do this, Lord, I'm, I'm confused because what this, what's going to happen is that this is going to embolden them to conquer more nations, to go and do more evil things. It's going to cause them to be very arrogant, very prideful in themselves, and to worship themselves. And as well, it's going to cause them to have more confidence in their false gods. Because what happens whenever a nation goes up against another nation is they have their gods, and when one nation is successful, that nation is seen as having the more powerful god. We see many times in uh, the Bible where Israel is, the God of Israel is recognized as being a very powerful God. And the reason being because he's the only God. But come back and he says, Lord, if you allow them to be victorious over your nation, they're going to think that their own gods are better too. So we've got multiple problems here. You're, from Habakkuk's point of view, he's looking and saying, Lord, you are righteous, you are good, and why are you allowing this evil? Because two wrongs doesn't make a right, Lord. That's what he says. He says, this, this doesn't make sense. Something that I pointed out last week, and I, I'd like to understand this again, is, you know, because we think something that's very similar to this is Jonah, right? The Lord says, you know, Jonah, you need to go to Nineveh. You need to tell them what's going on. And Jonah's like, no, they're evil people. I don't want them to be saved. I don't want them. They might repent. And you'll, you'll spare them. He, he, he questions what God is wanting to do. And you know, something I, I want to point out is... There's a difference between being confused by God's will and asking for clarification and criticizing God's will. Jonah criticized God's will and did his own thing in spite of what the Lord had said. Jonah said, this is what I want, and so I'm going to do what I want. But back in here, he's asking a question. He's saying, Lord, I want to know what's... This doesn't make sense to me. What is your desire? And we see in verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me, what I shall answer when I am reproved. Habakkuk actually talks about here and he says, he's actually in the position ready to hear what the Lord has to say to him. He wants the Lord to, tap, to kind of explain things for him, to, to correct him. So why he's right. He's still trusting in God's will here. He's still trusting in the Lord, and he knows the Lord to be righteous. He knows the Lord to be good. He's just confused. 
And he's asking for clarification. Chapter 2, the Lord provides that clarification. He basically tells back and he says, Yeah, I'm going to use this nation to overthrow Israel, to punish them for their sins. But I'm also going to give this nation what they deserve as well. Yeah, they're going to be emboldened. Yeah, they're going to think themselves great. Yeah, they're going to worship their own gods. But I'm still going to overcome them as well. They're going to get what they deserve also. What we see here is that the Lord still is a just God in this. And he's not compromising it. As well, I mentioned it last week, but there are many things that we do not understand about the way the Lord does things. There's a lot of questions that we have, and there are times, though, where the Lord's answer is similar to Job, where he says, I'm the Lord of all. I created all, and I don't have to tell you. I don't have to explain myself. You should just be confident in me and knowing what I'm doing. He doesn't always give us all the answers. He doesn't always explain exactly why it is this is this way or that way. We can still be confident, though, in his nature and who he is and, and, and know that even when he doesn't explain exactly why he's doing it this way or explain every question that we may have in it, we can still be confident in him. Uh, we can still, and we, we should still be faithful to him. But here uh, he uh, prophesies of the uh, judgment that is going to come upon, upon Babylon as well for their sins. And he's going to describe some things about them, some things that they've done, and the way that the Lord is going to uh, carry out his judgment. So let's go ahead and have. Uh, a word of prayer, then we'll get started. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity we have to be here and study your word again. So thankful for each of those that have made the effort to be here this evening, uh, to be here to study your word and to worship you, Lord. We pray that you would open our hearts to your word. Please help us to be attentive. Let's you know, be focused on it and to learn from it, Lord, to grow from it. That's you would guide and direct me that everything ultimately would be for your honor, glory, and your will. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> First section of chapter 2 we have here. Uh, a warning for Babylon, and we have in verses 1 through 3, the uh, beginning of a message the Lord describes what Habakkuk is to do with this message that he's giving to him now. Uh, and we read in verse 1, it says, And I will stand, stand upon my watch, and will set me upon the tower, and will watch to see what you will say unto me, and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Uh, he writes here in Habakkuk, he says, I'm standing watch. And we know this symbolism we know best from uh, when Ezekiel talks about it. That there's the responsibility of the watchman to stand watch and, and to watch for the enemy. And that when, the mess, when he sees the enemy coming, he's supposed to ring the bell, right? He's supposed to sound the alarm so that the, the city can respond to what is coming. There, there's a warning to be given, and Habakkuk says, he says, I'm, I'm going to stand my watch. I'm still going to, to stay here. He's, uh, Jonah, when given the message of the Lord, his decision was to abandon his post, was it not? He was given, he was supposed to do it, and he, he didn't just say, no, Lord, I'm not going to do that. He, he abandoned his post where he was even located. He didn't go where he was supposed to be. He didn't even stay where he was. Trying to get as far away as he possibly could. But Habakkuk, he's different here. He says, 
I'm going to stand my watch. I'm, you know, keep me here. And I'm, I'm going, he says, and I'm going to watch to see what he will say unto me. He says, I, I'm waiting for the Lord to give me the information, for the Lord to tell me what to share with the people. For the Lord's message. I'm standing ready to hear it. And I love this uh, phrase here he has as well where he says, and when I shall answer when I am reproved or corrected. You know, he had these questions in chapter 1, and this is where we see that his attitude was not necessarily that of criticizing the Lord, but just of confusion, of, of wanting to know, to understand what the Lord is doing here. Then his desire is to follow the Lord. He, he's just confused. And he says, I know that there's something that I'm missing about this. I know that I'm wrong, that what the Lord is doing is correct, is right. The Lord's not wrong, I'm wrong. I'm misunderstanding something here. So I'm going to be attentive, I'm going to watch, and I'm going to wait for the Lord to tell me the truth. For the Lord to correct me. And this is a great attitude to have. This is an attitude of humbleness in the face of the Lord, in respect to the Lord. Now, we all have our own understanding, we all have our own opinions, we all have the way that we think it should be. But the trouble is whenever we are not willing to allow the Lord to correct those things, to think ourselves better, think ourselves greater. And I want us to realize this here. Habakkuk is saying this before his answer is given. Before the Lord's answer is given. He says, I know I'm wrong. I know the Lord is wrong. He doesn't need the Lord's answer to prove that he's wrong. He knows he is. That there's something he's missing. And in relation to the Lord... There's always going to be something that we are missing. He understands things infinitely better than we do. He sees things and, and knows details that we cannot comprehend that we don't even know about. Now we see the Lord begins his answer in verse 2. He says, And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. The Lord responds to him, and he, he starts it off, and he says, I'm, I'm going to give you this vision now. I'm going to give you this information. I want you to make sure to write this down. He says, write this vision, and notice here, he says, and make it plain upon the tables. He says, I want you to make sure to write it down in a way that people can understand it. Make sure to write it down in a simple way. There are things about God's Word that are very deep, but yet it is still written for us to understand it. It is written for all to be able to read and to know. God doesn't want His Word written in a way that you have to be some special person to be able to understand the things of it, to be able to read it. To study it for yourself, it's for everyone to be able to read. Written plainly. You know, I there are some that at times like to try and show off their education of different words and when they, they speak they, they speak using words and phrases and things that normal people can't understand that's fine if you're speaking to people that can understand it but you're doing yourself no good speaking or presenting God's word in a way that's unable that people can't understand intentionally making it harder the Lord's desire is for everybody to be able to plainly understand his word and the reason he says that he may run that readeth it so that they can respond to it 
So those that read it can know what they need to do and can respond to it and respond to it quickly. God's Word is not given to us just for us to know it, just for us to have the knowledge of it. It's there for us to respond to. He gave it to us plainly. He gave it to us clearly so that we could read it, so we could understand it, we could apply it, and we could change our lives with it. It's pointless for us to use it for any other means than to respond, to take action on it. Next thing is that the Lord promises that it will come true as well in verse 3. It says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, when they are good and when they are bad. The Lord tells him, he says, you need to tell people about this because it's going to happen. There, there's, there's an appointed time where it's going to happen. And when it happens, it's going to go exactly the way that I told it, said it's going to happen. There's not going to be anything in it. It's going to be like, oh, you lied. The things that the Lord ordains, the things that the Lord tells us of, it will happen exactly the way that He says. And it will happen exactly when the time is right. Exactly when He said it to happen. You know, there's a lot of things about Revelation. A lot of things in it that maybe some could look at and say, oh, I don't know how that's going to happen. Well, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. We don't know the exact day it's going to happen, but it will. And it's going to take place exactly the way that the Lord set it out to do. Whether you believe it or not. It's best for you to prepare for it. Be ready for when it comes. Now he begins speaking of the of Babylon and he begins talking about the unjust man. In verse 4, it says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright to him, but the just shall live by his faith. Yea, also, because he transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. Now, in this chapter, overall it's talking about Babylon, but as well, there are things in it that reference to the leader as well. We know him, uh, and he's, we see the most about him in Daniel, uh, by the name of Nebuchadnezzar. And, you know, one of the things that uh, Habakkuk talks about in, in chapter 1 was that they were going to be, become very emboldened, very arrogant. If they were, were going to think that themselves very powerful. This is exactly what happened with Nebuchadnezzar. He looked at himself and all the things that he accomplished and said, Man, I'm a really great guy. I'm really awesome. I've done all these things. And he gets to the point of basically calling himself a god. He thinks himself a god. He's not even worshiping other gods. He's worshiping himself. And he lifts himself up. And it's a very entertaining way in which the Lord humbles him. But notice here in verse 4, we're, we're talking about this unjust man. And look how it describes it. It says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. He tells us that the one that seeks to be lifted up, or that lifts himself up, his soul isn't in a good place. He is an unjust man. He's an unrighteous man. 
This is not the attitude. This is not the, the, the lifestyle, the, the way that a righteous man lives. This is the way that an unrighteous man lives, an unjust man lives. And this is what he does. He, he, he desires to lift himself up because of the sin that is within him. But as well here, it, it compares what a righteous man does in the second half. It says, but the just shall live by his faith. The just man, though, the righteous man, he doesn't live to prop himself up, to lift himself up. He lives for his faith in the Lord. That is his driving motivation. That is his, his attitude in life. The unjust man, his attitude in his life is, how can I lift myself up? How can I make myself greater? But the righteous man, his attitude is, how can I lift up the Lord? How can I follow the Lord? How can I do the things of the Lord? His faith is his focus. His attitude. It is not himself. It is not his own glory, his own accomplishments. It's the Lord. It's following him. There's no room in your life to prop up yourself whenever you're focused on the Lord. There's no room for it. He continues talking about this unjust man and describing him. He says, yea, also, because he transgresseth by, transgresseth by wine, he is a proud man, neither keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is as death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto him all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. You know the thing about the, the one that is trying to lift themselves up? They can never be satisfied. The unrighteous person, the unjust person, cannot be satisfied with the things that he is striving for. He's going to work in all of these things. He's going to do all of these things to try and gain more to him. He, he's not going to, to stay at home because he's got to go out and he's got to get more for himself. He's got to do more to lift himself up. His desire continues to enlarge, to grow greater and greater and greater. Anyone that says in trying to lift up themselves or to gain their own desires, to fulfill their own desires of the flesh, anyone that says, if I did just a little bit more, I'll have enough, is lying to themselves and lying to everybody else. Because all that happens is the desire increases. It grows. It is never satisfied. The one that is going after the flesh, that is going after themselves, cannot be satisfied. It's not going to happen. You're just going to have a bigger thing that you want. This isn't it is as death cannot be satisfied. It's going to be the death of them. And you don't have to look around too far to find people that literally killed themselves trying to lift themselves up. Literally ran their lives into the ground trying to gain more and more and more wealth. The case of Nebuchadnezzar, his desire is just what but to gather unto him all nations and heapeth unto him all people. His desire was to keep on conquering people, to make people worship him. And that's what he did. He literally tried to get people to worship him. One of the, uh, whenever uh, the men came up against Daniel and wanted to get him overthrown. The way that they did it was by appealing to his ego. Saying, hey, just make everybody worship you and you alone for a while. And he did it. But 
is not going to be satisfying. Because of this, he's going to make some enemies. So make some enemies. Verses 6 through 8 says, Shall not all these take up a parable against him? And a taunting proverb against him and say, Woe to him that increaseth that which is not his. How long? And to him that ladeth himself with thick clay. Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee and wake and that shall vex thee? And thou shalt be for booties unto them? Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee because of men's blood and for the violence of the land of the city and of all that dwell therein. What naturally happens whenever you go about this lifestyle is you make some enemies. And the Lord says those enemies, they're going to go up against him. We see the, he begins in 6 telling them that those that he has oppressed will rise up against him. And he, he just tries to say, shall not all these take up a parable against him and a taunting proverb against him and say, woe to him that increaseth that which is not his, how long? And to him that leadeth, leadeth himself with thick clay. And says that those people, they're going to come up with some interesting sayings against you. They're going to come up with some uh, parables and uh, proverbs and taunting him. You're going to start saying stuff. And isn't that typically what happens? Somebody that's very arrogant, somebody that tries to control everybody, people start making up jokes about them. Start saying stuff that's negative about them, that taunts them. And it's this, this attitude here. And, and, and they... Describing this is that increases that which is not his. How long? And to him that layeth himself with thick clay. This description here, and to him that layeth himself with thick clay. This thick clay, it's referring to, to riches, to, to heavy, it literally means heavy debts. And he's heaping to himself gold and, and silver and, and, and things that are just dirt, really. But he's trying to take all these things and, and he's taking that which is in him. He's stealing from people to gain his own wealth, to gain his own riches. And it's putting them against him because in verse 7 it says, Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee and awake that shall vex thee and thou shalt be for booties unto them or, or plunder unto them. It, ta it starts off as people mumbling. People talking about how much, and then eventually they rise up against them. They come up against them and they overthrow their oppressor. He says, This is what's going to happen. They're going to rise up suddenly and they're going to bite you. They're going to awaken and they're, they're going to take all of, all of your riches that you gained for yourself, that you pulled in for yourself. They're going to come up. And they're going to plunder you. They're going to turn all of your riches into booty for themselves. So all this work that you will do to gain all of this, to keep all of this, is gone. And he says in makes it very clearly that it is in response to the unjust things that he's done. He says in 8, Because thou hast spoiled many nations, all the remnant of the people shall spoil thee because of men's blood, and for the violence of the land and the city and all that dwell in. He says, and this is all in a response to everything that you've been doing. It's everything coming up against them again. They've spoiled many nations, and the remnant of the people shall spoil thee. Those that made it out, that, that survived it, they're going to come back up against. That's what oftentimes happened. 
Whenever a nation would come in and conquer, there was always a, a remnant of the original people that would consistently keep fighting back against them. But eventually, and many times, they overcome them. They overthrow them. And he says, this is what's going to happen. All those nations that you worked so hard to overcome, to, with, to destroy, they're going to rise back up against you and overthrow you. Now in the second half of this chapter we have some, well, four times he says, woe unto him, and then describes a sin or an evil attitude. And he describes all of these which is meant to be pointed at the Babylonians and even Nebuchadnezzar, but is also something that is applicable to all with these things. The first one that he identifies is he that covets. He says in verse 9, But woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness, to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. First thing he, I, he says is, Woe to him that is a, has an evil covetousness. And he describes this evil covetousness as that he may set his nest on high and he may be delivered from the power of evil. His desire is to be above everybody else. To have his nest to where everybody, or his home, where everybody sees him, everybody recognizes him. He is the greatest. They are the greatest. And to be in a complete place where he was unable to be overcome by anybody else. Nobody can come up against them. So they're greatest in position and the greatest in power. And he says, woe well, unto those that desire this. This is an evil thing to do. To covet these things, to want this in your life. In verse 10, it, it even describes the way that he uh, fulfills this covetousness. It says, Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people and hast sinned against thy soul. The way that they achieve this is not in a good way either. Instead of honorably leading his home, to do what is good, to do what is right, to lead others in the right path, in a good path, instead, he's consulted, he's led them to be shameful, to do evil things, to do horrible things. Oh, this is a sad thing. If there are so many that are in a place of position to lead people to do what is good, and instead they use that position to lead people to do evil. There's so much good that can be accomplished by being in a place of power. But yet there are so many that use it to do evil. And lead others to make the same mistakes. And he describes as well and says in when they do this, they have sinned against thy soul, their own souls. He's cut down others, he's destroyed others, and in the process they've destroyed themselves as well. They've hurt themselves. You know, there are so many that think by doing these things, by lifting themselves up, that they're doing good for themselves. By having this, this covetous desire to do all of this for themselves and, and to be great. And really, they're just killing themselves. Really, they're just destroying themselves on the inside. 
That's why you see so many that when they're consumed, and they, they're, they're coveting to be powerful and to be great and to have much wealth, that they're thoroughly a horrible person. Because they've corrupted themselves. When that's your focus, when that's your desire, it corrupts you, destroys you. In verse 11, he says, For the stone shall cry out of the wall, and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. Yeah, they've built their riches, they've built all of it. Their entire wealth on other people by destroying others, by undoing the. And here it's describing the, the stone of the wall and the, the beam, the, till, the, the building materials of their home, which they built it all upon people, right? And it says those people there, again, I'm going to be talking against you. We, we just had it in, in verses 6 and 7. It, it talked about the, the people that had been overcome, that had been oppressed, coming up against them. It says, you've done all this to, to, to be great, to be amazing. And what's happened is you've, all these people that you built your empire upon, they're going to start talking to each other. They're going to start responding to each other. And it's going to cause them to rally up against you. You're putting everybody against you. You're going to be up there all by yourself. Second blow that he does is him that builds with blood. Verse 12, he says, Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood, and establish a city by iniquity. Now there's many ways to build up a city, to establish a town. But he says, those that do it with evil, with killing, with unrighteous things, he says, woe to them. Because in verse 13 he says, Behold, is it not of the Lord of hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire, and the people shall weary themselves for uh, very vanity? They've done all this work to, to build it up and everything. But the Lord, He's going to come against, and, and He's going to put fire, He's going to destroy it. And you've done all this work to try and build yourselves up to be in this great thing, but when the Lord comes up against you and His fire comes upon, you're going to try and overcome it, you're going to try and stop it, but you're going to labor in vain in this. You're going to see all this that you put together on your evil. And the Lord's going to come in and He's going to try and stop it. Or He's going to, try, he's going to destroy it all and you're going to try and stop it. You're not going to. You can't. You're going to labor in the fire. You're going to be working in it. But you're going to wear yourself out doing something that is vain. Vain. 